So Samir here, your host from uh, Metaverse Mentors, today with Andrew Harkin from uh, Mesmerize, who will introduce himself uh, as well. Thank you, Andrew, uh, for joining Metaverse Mentors. Very glad to have you. Great to be here. Pleasure to be with you. I'm super interested uh, to hear from a leader in uh, the Metaverse space, running an uh, organization on this innovative field that's emerging and becoming bigger and bigger to hear what the developments uh, are like and what's going on. But before we really dive into uh, specifics, I'm curious about your background and yeah, how you came and entered this kind of uh, domain and landscape. Can you uh, walk us through that a bit, uh, Andrew? Sure thing, yes. Yeah. So um, I started my career as a newspaper reporter. So this was back in the early 80s. This was actually before even newsrooms were computerized. So this was typewriters and uh, copy tasters and printing presses. So, you know, you kind of think about the transformation uh, in the course of just my career is pretty extraordinary. So uh, then I was a BBC journalist for a long time, for 10 years, current affairs show, uh, night editor of the Today program, you know, flagship current affairs show for the BBC. And then there was this pivotal moment in 96 where I thought that uh, even before the BBC or anyone had a website, I could see the uh, the dawn of the consumer internet. I wanted to be involved in that very first, you know, like the wave, uh, the first wave. It felt like being in the at the dawn, the birth of radio or television, a whole new medium. So I left the BBC and I spent a uh, pretty extraordinary 10 years at Microsoft, including uh, stints in the UK, Europe, and then I moved to the Pacific Northwest, where I was editor-in-chief of MSN.com, which at that point, probably the largest audience ever gathered on the planet, that in Yahoo.com. This is pre-Google, pre-Facebook. Um, and I, that's where I really got into the combination of editorial, business, and technology, and ran a product development group of 100 strong, really rolling out the MSN homepage globally. And then uh, it came back to the UK, spent 10 years at Sky, uh, and I was the digital director for Sky News for the last five years. And that's where I really um, was responsible for product development, editorial, business, but also strategic partnerships with a lot of the big tech players. Um, and that's where that led me into the 2016 uh, decision to go and uh, launch Mesmerize. Because what I found in 2016, it felt very similar to where I was in 96, where it was the start of a whole new wave of computing innovation that I really felt was going to be just like the internet again. It was going to be so exciting and I wanted to be right in again at the beginning of that. So founded the company in 2016 uh, and yeah, here we are now. Well, thanks for that introduction. Already plenty of questions uh, <laughs> emerged from there, but I guess two questions uh, are on uh, the forefront uh, here. The first question is, you said a very conveniently and like it was very natural to make this pivot to Microsoft from an editorial background. But I can imagine, especially in that time, those two are completely different worlds. So I'm interested yes. in how that transition uh, looked like. And secondly, um, in 2016, you have some prehistory about the pre-internet and after internet that I don't have as a millennial. But I'm curious what kind of signals were you witnessing and observing that you was like, hey, this is looking very similar. I want to be part of that. Can you yes. talk a bit through that? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So I think the, the cultural shift from public service broadcaster to uh, Microsoft was um, extreme culture shift. So um, in the BBC, um, the, you know, the, you're, you're on the whole on a, on a, on a kind of bedrock of stability and what you know, what really mattered was that the content was changing all the day. It was you were really, really as good as your last program, but no one ever really said, you know what, should we even be doing the Today program? That that wasn't a discussion. It was really just about how you really um, executed really well. So it was a you know really around journalist uh, journalistic execution, um, and um, very different to Microsoft, where literally everything is questioned all the time. You know, why are we doing this? And I think part of that was really when you kind of think about that stage um, of the consumer internet, that it really wasn't uh, clear exactly how it was going to develop. So it was a very dramatic time of extraordinary innovation. It felt very much like Wild West. You know, anything could happen. Anything could change at any point. 
and that's where I this really was went in from. 1996, you said? Correct, yeah. Okay, yeah. Exactly. So very, very early in that kind of first wave of the consumer internet, people were you know, still on slow dial-up modems. And uh, I mean, if you kind of think, if you look at the media coverage at that time, a lot of that media coverage was, you know, this internet thing is ridiculous. It's never going to take off. You know, it was all it was all jokes about the internet. Sounds and very then, familiar. It does, it does. And then really over just a period of a couple of years, it became clear that this thing was going to be an extraordinary. You imagine now trying to uh, live your life without the internet. It's kind of almost inconceivable. Um, but back then, you know, it, it was a completely different world. And I think it's worth that having that historical context of how, th how quickly things have moved. Um, and for example, um, you know, part of that, you, you think about the, the form factor at that point, you know, it was desktops, it, you know, the, the mobile phone really hadn't taken off. It were, there were early WAP phones and there was going to be the year of the mobile phone year after year after year. And then suddenly, you know, with the iPhone, it became, okay, this is a real thing now that can, that can, um, kind of flourish and become an incredible part of our lives. And, one of the things that I always think about is, you know, if I left home without my mobile phone, I would just go back and get it because my life couldn't um, couldn't really exist properly. I just wouldn't be able to work. I wouldn't be able to communicate. You know, you imagine how essential that's become. And there are definite parallels with what's going on um, in uh, VR and AR. Uh, but I think that, that that sense of the shift is quite an important kind of context um, yeah, to tie, for, to, tie, yeah. To, tie in, to tie in there. So this was, yeah. Uh, yeah, this this was the run through of the emergence of the internet, and then you were yeah. in 2016, and yes, yeah, I already asked that. What, what were the signals? But also, I think uh, Facebook and uh, Quest started. Uh, they acquired them in 2014 or 2013. So there was already some VR solutions. Uh, yes maturing because vr is already existing far uh, far earlier but uh, yeah. very uh, yeah nascent solutions and i curious what was uh, precisely in 2016 that you were seeing so what i was seeing then really was i think it was the so part this was part instinct um so part of part of this was definitely instinct uh, and my instinct there was actually when you put on a vr device um, or you could really immediately see the potential of it, or I could. I could just see, okay, I think this is going to be a real next big step in the evolution of the internet. So it was partly instinct. It was also um, the fact that I could see the level of investment that was coming from the big tech players. So when you saw what you know, what Facebook were putting behind it, um, and, um, you know, at that point, Google was, you know, doing the whole thing with um, uh, cardboard, etc. You remember all that stuff? Um, and, you know, thinking about where Apple would go, where Microsoft would go. So I think there were those two things. One, one was I could imagine the potential of this. Pretty similar in the way I'd done in 96. I just thought there were some real things that were going to happen here that would be very significant. And it was backed up by even then the the big tech players were really investing heavily in this, so it's those two combined things, and then the the third thing is is also having spent you know well over thirty years in in essentially large enterprises, you know I wanted to do something on my own. That's always been one of my one of my ambitions. I met my uh, co-founder Dallas Ismechi, and you know at that point. It was very exciting to go and launch uh, and found a new company. So very, it was those three I'm things. I'm very interested yeah. that you're seeing uh, th that. Andrew. Sorry uh, to interrupt you there, but we have uh, had a couple of entrepreneurs on uh, already on uh, Metaverse Mentors, and what we're often seeing is that they either operated already as an employee in the technological field, and they had this ambition already for a long time or they encountered a, another person who came up with an idea and they were like hey there is a connection here let's see how we can uh, build something uh, together mm. and i'm interested in uh, that transition at that time 
What did it look like for you? Because you're working in a big enterprise and then suddenly you have built, you have to build everything from the ground up with your co-founder. I, I can imagine that's uh, yeah, f a quite different uh, environment yeah. and a tool set of skills uh, that you're utilizing. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. It's one hell of a shock. <laughs> so, um, so I think the way I would, I would characterize that is so I'd, I'd been an executive at an enterprise, at a, you know, in an enterprise at an executive level for quite a long time. And I definitely had honed my skills of how to work in a large enterprise. So in an enterprise, you, you, you normally got a five year plan. There's, you know, there's lots of different divisions working together and you suddenly have, you know, all of this momentum that comes from lots of people working together. And the job there is often alignment. You know, how do you get these teams? You know, they've got lots of resources. They're funded. They're not worried about, you know, um, is anyone going to get paid this month? That's not in. That's not, that's not in their mind. It's really about okay, can we get the combined um, uh, output of all these teams heading in the right direction? And so there's a real kind of you know uh, an enterprise set of skills, and and part of that is also you have these antennae so you can see oh, there's some there's a problem here or you know i need to do something here you have that sort of enterprise level things. exactly there's patterns and you can just see them and again a lot of it is you don't do it consciously it's just sort of you know you become very used to it mm -hmm. so i think you go from that to running a, a startup and uh, in the early days you know they there's there's a lot of personal jeopardy you know so that that's one thing that um that's a clear thing. You really have to put yourself on the line and it really tests your belief in the idea and yourself. Um, so there's that, you know, that kind of and what, jeopardy what aspects to this. do you put yourself on the line? Like uh, t simply time engagement or letting go of all the safety and uh, comfortableness that you had in your enterprise, be it mastered all the elements yeah. kind of, or in what uh, sense putting uh, everything on the line? Well, in the sense that, you know, if you don't do it, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So there's that. That's the, the key thing, which is, um, you know, the whole initiative is really driven in those early days, you know, by a couple of individuals who believe in it and are prepared to really kind of risk everything on making this a success. Mm -hmm. And um, so that that whole kind of uh, entrepreneurial spirit is definitely something I've had to learn. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I think the journalistic background is helpful to that because, you know, journalists are really entrepreneurial. When you're working on a story, you're up against very tight deadlines. You know, if you're two minutes late uh, on a on a deadline, you know that's a that's a real sin, and and you might as well not have bothered. So I there's that kind I have of tremendous respect for uh, journalists and yeah. people who are writing because sometimes I'm writing blogs and I'm like, oh, this is so so incredibly difficult to pick the yeah. right words, right terminology, and make everything stick together. I cannot imagine yes. how it is to do that as a professional uh, yeah. job. So yeah, I can imagine. Well, particularly when the you know the the deadline's approaching, everyone's shouting. There's lots of extraneous information some of which has to be completely dis discarded and disregarded so it's a, it's that kind of stuff and i think so i think that was actually helpful because it is, it does have a kind of entrepreneurial nature to it um that i think definitely helped me as i became an entrepreneur but i learned many many things you know part of this is the um ability to not try and make every decision because you know you're looking at a future that is very very unclear and if you try and game out every decision you know it's all fine except that the first decision is probably wrong <laughs> so one of the things i learned there is you know you make the decisions that are in front of you you have a you know you have a vision about where you're going going but you have to become very comfortable that things are rapidly going to change and that you need to respond quickly to what what's happening around you yeah, yeah. Can, can you illustrate that journey? So 2016, you saw this opportunity, you were excited yeah. about it, you met your co-founder. What did your journey look like? And much of unex unexplored questions, a lot of unknown unknowns. What did it yes. look like? Yes, so in 2016, it essentially was really me and my co-founder. 
uh, we're now a team of 130 people. So that, in terms of the growth of the company, you know, that's a pretty extraordinary um, uh, growth in terms from a startup to amazing, yeah. a company of 130 people. So, so w- one of that is the ability to kind of hire well, you know, build out the right teams, etc. So that that's one thing. I think the one one thing that I I think really demonstrates what's happened in in those five years is that if I was going to go and demo a VR experience to someone in 2017, I would have had to take an immensely powerful laptop, gaming laptop. I'd have had to take an expensive headset that was heavy. That would have had wires. That would have had sensors. You know, and the setup probably takes 20 minutes, and I, on the whole, wouldn't go unless one of our de- developers was coming with me because there'd be some problem that I couldn't fix. So that's where it was then. So, you know, now where we are is we have kind of VR headsets that are the, that are these three themes have kind of really dominated much of my career. I think one is portability, you know, so the headsets now are standalone and untethered and portable. So you can take them anywhere um, you know, you can put it in a carry case, you know, you're not taking a laptop with you, etc. So I think the portability is clear. I think the power of that device, again, these devices get more and more powerful, and we'll see that emerging definitely over in the next form factor. The power of the device um, in order to really do great experiences gets better and better. And then the, the price, you know, the, the, the again, the, the cost of doing a VR demo um, would probably be six or seven thousand by the time you got it all together, and now we have an you know an untethered headset from Quest, but there's also others, Pico, etc. And you're into the you know three or four hundred dollars um, to do anything really that that could have been done in that larger kind of VR rig. So I think that's that's really one big shift. I think the other one has been you know a bit like I was saying with the internet. You know, people are really waking up to what this could do, and you know, part of that I think has you know, clearly the uh, um, Meta, you know, really betting the betting the farm on this is you know, big big statement of where it's going. We know Microsoft are investing heavily with Mesh, um, so again, it feels like the that stuff has really helped, and I I think what's ha- what's happening now is that many enterprise companies are really waking up to this and are being asked questions you know what is the metaverse strategy for company x and they now want to engage and experiment um so i think that's that's one of the the real shifts in terms of the market has changed pretty dramatically as well yeah yeah and you mentioned already uh, some names that are participating in and perhaps have the goal of uh, ultimately dominating uh, the space as you always see when new technologies um, emerge and that ties also into the question uh, can you tell us a bit about what mesmerize uh, is trying to uh, sure. accomplish and also you had this pre-knowledge of what uh, what google did at the time microsoft and how ambitious and rapidly uh, they can move if they uh, set their goals towards a specific domain so for me but that's just personally for me it could also see, seem daunting in a sense in a way like okay we are just starting out with two people <laughs> and ultimately we have to face all this adversity from those other players but i can imagine there are different niches as well but i'm interested how you uh witnessed and experienced uh, that dynamic yeah so i think uh, on that one um i i kind of flip it on its on its head a bit Imagine if we were here and Meta had said, you know what, we tried the quest, it didn't work, you know, we're going to go and carry on with our 2D environment. Imagine Microsoft saying, no, we don't really believe in spatial computing. Imagine a world where Apple isn't about to release some amazing new VR device. So that that is a very different world, you know. Thank goodness it's we've got the, exactly the opposite. We've got the opposite where you've got big technology players saying, look, this is this is immensely exciting and we're we're all in. Like radical uh, so, validation. Yeah, so to me that you know um you know mesmerize isn't isn't gonna be able to drive adoption of VR globally. Um so 
we are we're conscious of where our position so the fact that these big companies are you know investing heavily is fantastic um and i think that you know one of the things that we we see them as partners you know so i don't i don't think there's any any risk there f- for us so you know we have good relationships with the companies and um you know for us they're solving big problems and then we're taking advantage of that so i think i don't i don't see it as a conflict i think i think that's all really positive yeah. um and in terms of mesmerize itself so where we are right now we are our, our kind of vision is to you know create a, a portfolio of products using this technology to really unlock human potential and we have been very focused on kind of enterprises so the core thing we're building is a we're building an underlying platform that allows us to create you know amazing experiences we then have a, a core product which is gatherings and that really is uh, around the sense of presence so to give you an example of that we just did uh, this week we did a harvard business school alumni reunion so there were 95 people in that reunion from 28 different countries and oh. the professor who um sort of taught them did a live presentation so they're all represented by avatars they're all in the same environment and the professor does a you know what are the three things you remember from my course so it's that amazing kind of ability to have presence so that event was would never happen without uh you know the 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 vr technology wouldn't happen without our product so i think that is a kind of really good example of the kind of things we're doing around enabling people to have the sense of presence when geographically remote and that's been you know we can see that in terms of the way people are going to work in the future hybrid working is definitely here to say um you know some people still are not able to travel or don't want to travel to events and conferences and again this gives you the sense that you can be there um in a way that's different to 2d yeah i think it's an incredible example that we're just giving also on yeah. the scale with so many people uh, to be able to produce something like that and mm. there's different uh, virtual worlds that are trying to uh, establish a uh, similar experience like vr chat all space so in terms of mesmerize my question i guess would be like w- w- what is the the part of the the chain that you are uh, offering because I- is it a, the hardware to the end of the experience or is it guiding towards different worlds or where does uh, mesmerize come in yes yeah, so our core thing here really is about building out um, enterprise ready experiences so f- for that they they we have a system of different kind of ecosystems or different you know different campus mm. per uh, organization and the thing about that is that that sort of campus can have um, breakout rooms, networking spaces. You can have theatres, presentation rooms, etc. And that the only people who are in that experience or even see that experience are the people from that enterprise or people they invite in. So it's and really a customized experience specific for that uh, particular enterprise. Correct. Yeah, and it and security, you know, scalability. That's kind of really key to us. So. Um, we're not going after a broad consumer audience. Ours is very focused on an enterprise who um, wants to engage with their staff that are now remote, that wants to. So we did another event um, about uh, two weeks ago, which is an all hands meeting uh, over two days for a company that is incredibly geographically um, uh, disparate. And so we staged their event. Uh, There's about 150 people in that event. And they were from Vietnam, India, uh, Europe, US. And again, in that event, there were keynotes. There were kind of, you know, fun things. There was quizzes, etc. Um, so in the past, that 150 people probably would have converged on a central location somewhere in the world to do this. But, but now... People can achieve the same things, sometimes even better, when doing this uh, in VR. 
Yeah, so do I then also correctly understand that the prerequisite to be able to set such an experience up is, of course, for all the uh, employees to have a virtual headset, right? Is it also, also orchestrated by Mesmerize or do you walk them to the process like, okay, these are the three criteria and then we facilitate you into setting up your uh, private campus, a private kind of uh, virtual experience? Yeah, so so we kind of we we essentially run all that. So one of the things that um, we we discovered early on is that business logistics was one of the big barriers, and so we we've tackled that. So we have an amazing logistics team. So we will actually source, dispatch, onboard people, um, so that we take care of that whole headset um, uh, question. Yeah, so that's one of the things that's been really important for us. I think that's great because there's yeah. a lot of, as you already mentioned some developments like the the rise of hybrid working, uh, pandemic, we don't we are now here but we don't know where we are in the future, uh, kind of ease like when you are disparately hmm. working, all those developments require or are shouting for something more interactive and I think the Correct. metaverse uh, provides that but then you have also this pr- just practical s- steps like okay headset how does that work which mm. one should i acquire but you completely organize it so i think that we do. it's really nice so that's kind of yeah. careless in a sense for the end the consumer and end user yes exactly so i think that's that's one of the things that we when you kind of think about being an entrepreneur and understanding what the problems are that was one of the things that uh, particularly my my co-founder Dallas is met I identified early on is that okay until everyone has got a, a metaverse enabled device we are going to have to with the, the with the uh, working with the enterprises take that headache away from them so you know we don't want them worrying about okay I've got to get the headset sorted out so for example um, we were just uh, in at a um, an event this week in uh, Boston at MIT in their emerging technology uh, conference and part of what we did there is we um, ran an installation at the physical event to show a VR concept proof of concept around resilience at work and again part of that was we just we handle all the headsets we send staff we run it um, to enable that to be a really good seamless experience yeah, so, so I think the high, yeah, I think hybrid, of, I think hybrid events will also be a, a big thing. So I think you know, as opposed to them all being completely virtual, I think we're now entering a world where there are in-person events and they have a big two D digital and also VR component. And then how do we bridge that gap? So for example, we did the Morning Star uh, investment conference. Morning Star has been an, an incredible partner for us for about five years now, and. Um, their in-person event um, in Chicago uh, about a month ago. Uh, again, we had a, a hybrid experience, so we actually had people there with uh, VR experiences, but also um, there were people in VR who were attending who can watch all the panels, all the streams, all the networking. And then in terms of bridging the gap, we got some of their keynote speakers who'd done their in-person event to the in-person crowd to then come to us, put on a VR headset, and then network and take questions in VR with people who are remote. So starting to bridge that, I think this blended um, approach to events will become pretty common. I think super interesting point that you're mentioning, because the uh, when I speak to some people about the metaverse who haven't necessarily heard about it a lot, uh, a common reflex is like, yeah, but the physical world's far more interactive. I'd rather sit with my colleagues here face to face than putting on some hardware and then interacting. But what you're actually saying, it doesn't replace one another. It's just complementary to each yeah. other. And by the hybrid form, that's probably the way that we will see it. So that's interesting. Yeah, so I, so I think I think I definitely don't believe you should try and do everything in VR. I mean, I just don't see the point of trying to do spreadsheets uh, or you know detailed word documents in VR. It doesn't make any sense. We've got other amazing devices, you know, that are brilliant at that. Where the where the where the real essence of VR, I think, is a sense of presence. You know, when you are not together, uh, and I think that's the reality of. I think there have been societal changes here, 
that you know this is going to be a real thing that yeah. people aren't always going to be together um you know even even in their working lives i think there'll be much more remote working i think in in travel i think the bar has been raised for you know do i want to fly around the world for that meeting um do i you know because travel budgets are uh, under pressure also there's all of the esg ecologically um, yeah, yeah exactly so, so i think the bar has definitely been raised for you know do i want to fly to the other side of the world for that conference or that event when i can get the same kind of experience in vr so i think yeah. but you know, but i'm 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 very pragmatic about that i don't think that um i'm not in any way saying that you know in person you know, meeting together in, in real life is incredibly valuable. I'm not in any way saying that VR replaces that. I think it's part of the toolkit yeah. that we now have. But what I'm interested in, because mm. with COVID, we were accustomed to work with uh, Teams, WebEx, Zoom, those two-dimensional yeah. interfaces, and there was no other way. Now this yeah. is... Uh, emerging and becoming more uh, mature do you see between those two kind of collaboration avenues seeing vr becoming a replacement of those or is that also kind of a hybrid where we will i think it's a hybrid okay yeah i, so I, I think we'll see with teams you know they've already told us with teams that they're actually going to have you know you have 2d experience in teams you can then turn up as an avatar in teams and i believe that they will create VR experiences that you know complement teams, mm. so I think I think that's the right way to think about it. Um, I mean, you know, who who knows? You know, one of the things that that's clear, and one of the things that's exciting about this is that there aren't any tailgates to follow right now. We are really creating new categories, new experiences. I mean, this is why I think the the early days of MSN are so reminiscent of this. Where you know, where was this going to go? Well, everyone's got a view <laughs> and it's rapidly evolving and that's yeah. why it's really exciting um and then there's no doubt in my mind that you know we will look back um in five years we'll look back on this and we'll look at the state of the form factors we're using now and it'll be like you know huge car phones that you know are now ridiculous but um you know we're yeah, making innovation only accelerates at least that's, yeah. that seems to me so Perhaps yeah. uh, trying to look in the future uh, about a five-year uh, span. What, what do you foreshadow in the metaverse uh, landscape in about five years? Is there a radical uh, change and evolution, or yeah? What, what do so you I see think? Now? So I think the so the I think one one thing that is absolutely critical is the form factor. You know, the 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 that will be such a huge change in this. So. I, I believe those um, devices will become lightweight, you know, 5G connectivity, and there'll be devices that you take with you. So I think I think that is uh, one of the biggest um, important things, which is that the actual devices that enable the real metaverse will see amazing innovation. And that that is that's really fundamental in terms of how how this is going to play out. For example, we know the new uh, device coming from um, uh, Meta will have you know this kind of better pass through, color pass through, and at that point you know you can imagine the scenario with um, pass through where you actually invite an avatar uh, into your room. <laughs> Uh, and they can be kind of properly co-present with you in your room, so I think I think that um, that's a real key thing. I think the second one is, from from our perspective, you know, we're very focused on enterprises, and I think it's really now about working out what are the use cases that enterprises really value that drive you know proper business outcomes. So, I mean, I think if you think about employee engagement, just employee engagement, massive topic. Uh, you know, there's clear evidence that training uh, can be done really well in VR, potentially much better than outside of VR. For example, you know, you can have, um, in the way we just described about the Harvard professor, you could assemble people from anywhere in the world 
and they can have the same experience with uh, an eminent academic or a teacher. Um, then I think one, what's interesting is then you can also then test in VR for understanding, you know, through simulation, etc. And again, there's some, some really exciting things there. Uh, and that, and we'll see. I think gaming clearly um, that that's already clear that that's going to be a very big category. So for for me, I think it's the the devices will change radically, and then I think we'll see really great wide enterprise adoption of this as it becomes more and more prevalent. Yeah, especially the last one that you mentioned with uh, training. I find that incredibly fascinating because mm. when I was in university, it was a lot of brute force learning and mm. putting things in my head. But when I go, uh, for, let's say I had a subject history at high school, I needed to learn all those facts. But when I watched the movie on Netflix about the Roman ages, I can remember anything, but that was just right. two dimensionally. But let's say I went to Rome and saw their things, then I can completely, or at least for 90%, reproduce that. And now with VR, we have the ability to mm. experience instead of brute force learning things and reading, which is very boring. So yeah, I think <laughs> I think that's also very interesting. So yeah. let's say I, I would be a, a bank, Andrew, with like 20,000 employees, and I get in contact with you to see what we can uh, accomplish uh, with the metaverse uh, with me mesmerize what does such a dialogue look like and what are the use cases that are uh, prevalent uh, with the enterprises that you are working uh, with yes i think there, there's a there's a few there so i think the first one is i think the the great thing about what what we've got is um, we can actually create a metaverse experience very very quickly so rather than talking about it, we can do something. And that would take the form of an executive meeting. You know, so we can create a virtual uh, headquarters that has boardrooms, network room, presentation rooms. Uh, it will be fully customized to uh, the, that enterprise. Can and I ask then, a question ab yeah. about that? So let's say I'm Deutsche Bank from here in uh, the Netherlands. Is it yeah. usual to emulate the building and the brand no. entirely, or are you trying to completely yeah. create a unique experience, not to emulate that? Yeah. So we're, we're not, at the moment we're we're not creating a digital twin of their experience. Mm -hmm. We're creating here's the here's the perfect VR experience. So we've done a lot of work around you know what's the right kind of presentation room. Um, what's the right boardroom? What's the right networking room? So these are VR environments, not replicant replication of an existing environment. Ah, okay, yeah. got it. Got yeah. It. So I think I think the the natural flow is okay. Great, we can do something immediately. So that can be an internal event. Um, it can also be an external event. So the work we've done with Morningstar has been around with one of our, our kind of core contacts there, Leslie Marshall, Marshall, who's head of experiential marketing. So she wants to engage uh, an external audience to Morningstar with VR. So it can be internal or external. And I think then what tends to happen, I think, uh, well, I know, is that uh, after that first engagement, we see that, you know, all these you know, incredibly bright, clever people in enterprises their minds are like, okay, now I understand we could do, what we could do is this. And um, so we have a kind of studio that allows us to then work with them to build out rapidly proof of concepts to kind of demonstrate, okay, what could this be? Um, so then, then we get into a, you know, a, a really interesting um, uh, phase where they're working out okay, what does it mean for this company to have a real metaverse strategy? Okay, just two critical validation uh, yeah. question here. I can imagine that the enterprise might also look at it through the lens of, okay, we can organize a physical event that costs X, we can organize a Zoom event that costs uh, Y, which is even cheaper than X, <laughs> and then we can do a metaverse event, which is next level interactivity, but is mm. top of the list in terms of cost. Is that the accurate uh, representation that I'm illustrating here um i don't know i don't think it is really so I, I think if you put on a physical event 
then the costs of that physical event are very high. So you've got venue hire, you know, if you kind of think about the level of transportation, you know, the flights, hotel rooms, you know, it be, that becomes a very big number to do that successfully. Mm. So, um, yeah, so the, what we would do would not come to that same cost. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. And the flow, you, you mentioned the flow. What are the time frames that we are looking at to co-create with Mesmerize such a unique experience? Uh, what do they ver- arrange from? Yeah, so it's it, we can we could do something if we if for example if you said you've got five hundred employees and you want to do an internal event for your top twenty five people in your company, and you said we want to do that in a week's time, we we'd be able to do that. Mm-hmm. So we would oh, create wow, a, a yeah. So small. we could create an ecosystem. Uh, so we have a, you know lots of these environments are built. So we just re- recreate that ecosystem for the company. And then we would get the headsets, and then we would stage the event. Yeah, okay. so really, we can move. Really we can I move didn't rapidly. I that it was that fast, especially for enterprise, yeah. because quite on a large scale. But that could yeah. be made possible in a week already. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's say two weeks. Give us a, a little breathing room. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, that, then. The but that's the kind of that's the kind of pace we're working to. Yeah. Uh, and able to deliver on, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I like th- that the company who, who who wants to create such experiences is able to also deliver input instead of having delivered an off-the-shelf experience. So then they also can experience and think about uh, that. So that, that's really cool. So yeah. I, I said there was uh, two critical questions. So the second one uh, I often hear when speaking about the metaverse, okay, it's super interactive. It's fun. It's far more engaging than the two-dimensional way. But what world problems does this metaverse actually uh, solve? Because it's hmm. just about fun and interactivity. How would you reply to that? Well, I think there's some... I mean, I think when people start to say, is it better than in real life? You've then got to work out, okay, so what does in real life mean? And for lots of... Um, people around the world they're denied all kinds of opportunity so you know access to education for example um so we're actually working on a project with um uh, some schools in chicago and in uh, um in los angeles which is really okay how can we make this real for for these kind of um um, kids at school, you know, how, how can we really show them the power of the metaverse? So that's that's one example. So I think that if you kind of think about um, where this goes, in the same way as the mobile internet has enabled a number of amazing things, I think there'll be a whole raft of things the mobile internet can't do that the metaverse can do. And I think the key thing there is is I think there is this sense of presence is the is the number one thing you know so you you are not in the same place as the people you need to be or you want to connect with and i think that you know that could be friends family business colleagues but i I think that presence thing you know as as this really kind of starts to develop is is pretty extraordinary because you're present in a way that you're not in 2d so you know we're now talking 2d we're not you know i can see you can see me but we're not in the same place so if we were doing this in, in gatherings in VR, we would be represented by avatars. We'd be in the same boardroom or networking room. We have spatial audio. So if I move, you turn to look at me and then we're looking out at the same scene. We're looking at the, you know, we're looking out over a, you know, Shanghai or whatever setting it is. And we can look at things and point to things. Um, and that it gives you a real sense of being in, in the same place. When we do a lot of our business meetings we have people in seattle washington uh, istanbul london manchester and then when you take the headset off you realize actually you know you're back in your own uh, room so i think that presence is really really key um, and i think that solves some major problems well andrew you sparked something incredibly interesting i think we should have a call separately after <laughs> this because great ironically why is metaverse meant this is about the metaverse but it's still two-dimensionally but now i was (laughs) fantasizing about 
what you are saying. Imagine that I was with you indeed in a virtual world or yeah. a specific camps created by Mesmerize. Then there would be even the possibility for other participants who have access Correct. to that uh, interface to be uh, an audience in real life there and even exactly. to participate. I've never seen a podcast where the audience <laughs> can intermingle and participate as well. So that's far more <laughs> sense of presence and engage. So that's really interesting. I, I didn't yeah. know about that. Yeah. Think of it. So I, I, I think I think that the um, the Harvard uh, example is a, is a really great one of, of that where you know literally that that is an audience spread out around the world and for two or three hours they were in the same experience and you know live conversation live questioning with the professor who was in boston you know yeah it's yeah. a pretty I, extraordinary thing yeah the sense of presence that's really a recurring theme that we have yeah. heard already in some episodes and i think it's also yeah. a very nice uh, yeah and um in um in the microsoft build conference recently uh satya nadella again he he also said he thinks the presence is the killer application for the metaverse presence. so I, I think the more more i think and um, think about this i think that's a key one i think there's another one really around you know, training uh, absolutely i think there's ways that we can train and educate um it, that is better than what we've got now so i think that's a clear a clear one um, so, for example, in the um, concept we d demonstrated at um, MIT, it was all around resilience and how, you know, you can use VR to make yourself, uh, help yourself become more resilient in terms of dealing with negative thoughts, engaging with um, adversity. And it was a, a really, and it was, you know, one of our advisors is a, is a top consulting um, psychiatrist, and we really got into a lot of the, the detail of what you can do in VR to make yourself more grounded and ready for the for the battle. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that could be uh, could be made a complete separate episode about that topic already alone because yeah. there's so much in there as well. But hmm. when you are fun, the time uh, flies. I already see we are almost. Uh, <laughs> Had an hour, but we we have definitely covered, uh, touched upon uh, some things: the entrepreneurial journey, the pre-internet evolution, and the possibilities for enterprises, but also the societal uh, possibilities. So I really like that. Uh, I think there is much more to cover, but for what we've covered in that amount of time, it was really fun. But perhaps to to wrap up with, is there something that we haven't discussed or? A message that, that you're like okay that, that's really interesting to emphasize on top of the importance of sense of presence what would you like to uh, wrap up with uh, Andrew yes yeah, so I, I think the, um, the the kind of key thing I, I really feel right now is that um, now is the time to engage on this you know it's it, it's at that point where um, you know it's it's significant we've got devices that allow us to, to really see where the future is going and I think if you're um, in an enterprise, particularly in the innovation side, this is got to be a key area to work on. So I think that's that's my kind of thing is, you know, timing is often critical. You know, you, if you go too early, then you're wasting time. If you go too late, you've missed the boat. So I, I think this is feels like the right time now to, to really get into this. Is that l largely because of the announcement that Meta did, uh, which obviously exploded the attention, or is there two or one other element that you're like, okay, this is really the the timing that, that you have that feeling? Yeah, so I th I think the the Meta thing was very important. Um, so that that's a key part of this, and it certainly put it on the agenda. You know, it it you know if you kind of think about the level of conversation about this before the connect conference um you know this has really put it on the agenda um but i think it's a culmination of that i think it's a culmination of the devices are you know are, are getting better and i think the the people just waking up to what this could herald essentially yeah yeah, very interesting. I see also some roles like chief metaverse emerging and right. other uh, strategies. So uh, that's definitely yeah. recognizable in there as well. And um, yeah, I always say to my guests, uh, they are welcome to uh, come back in the future. So then we can perhaps yeah, love uh, to. weigh where we are uh, at that time and to see how yeah. uh, everything has 
develop, but I found it incredibly fun and uh, educative uh, dialogue. And um, yeah, really looking forward to what this uh, interesting field is going to turn in uh, to Andrew. Okay. But thank you so much for joining. Great. Well, thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much.